On this episode of the Aesthetics Podcast, I go one-on-one with the creator of the unofficial NHL Uniform Database. But first, some news. The reverse retros are coming back. Plus, the best concept of the week tackles the upcoming Heritage Classic. The podcast starts now. Well, hello and welcome. Chris here from Aesthetics. Thank you for listening and for subscribing to the channel. Great to have you here. We've got a good episode lined up today. I'll get to a few news items in loose threads. My first guest interview after that. We'll hear from the creator of the unofficial NHL uniform database, Andrew Greenstein. Before we dive in, I just wanted to give you a quick look at what's new on the channel and what's on deck. Earlier this week, I posted a new video on the best concept artists of 2021 as voted by Aesthetics readers. I did a concept showcase top 10 last year, which was really well received, so I wanted to come back and do it again. Only this time, I decided to focus on the top 10 artists of the year, rather than the top 10 individual designs. Last year, we ended up with some people appearing more than once in the countdown, and I wanted to make sure that we had at least 10 different artists to celebrate this time around. And the best part is, there's commentary from all 10 designers, so if you haven't watched that video yet, please do. It's really more than a countdown. You get to hear directly from the artists about the thought process behind their work, which I think is always interesting. Also in the pipeline is episode two of my Design Decoded series, and that one we're comparing the NHL and AHL, looking at where minor league teams share their parent club's identity and where they have their own and all that. Should be a fun one. There's still a quick shift coming from Talkback crew member Mike Gould. He's got a fascinating jersey collection that he'll share with us. Uh, That should be out in February. And a little further down the road, you heard it here first, NHL Prototypes number four. That's right, the, uh, the three-part series is being extended. Some more unused designs have come to light in the last couple of months uh, since part three came out. So I'm in the research stage right now, but I do expect to have it out before springtime. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel and have notifications turned on. That way you'll be the first to know when I have a new video out. All right, let's get this episode started. First, we'll tie up some loose threads. Now, I did say that this segment would feature any news that came down since the previous episode, but I don't want to rehash what's already been put out in the flash reports. In other words, the 2022 NHL All-Star jersey reveal, that being official, and then the unofficial uh, Sabres third jersey leak. Uh, Those are both out there. Uh, So for today, I'll just remind you that they happened and direct you to those videos to see more. So that way I'm not doubling up on content that's already available here on the channel. Now, the big news first, in the process of confirming the Sabres third jersey leak, I was also able to confirm that the reverse retro program from Adidas is coming back next season. There have been whispers about it for a while, but now I'm confident in reporting that it is happening for sure. From what I've gathered, every team will be involved once again. The designs will be different from what we got in 2020, and I hear that some teams are even bending the definition of reverse retro. What that means exactly, I don't know. But it should give all the concept artists out there something fun to play with for the next couple of months. It seems to be jersey retirement season lately. A couple of teams have set numbers to the rafters this past week, and there are a couple of more coming in the next week. Last Monday, the St. Louis Blues retired Chris Pronger's number 44 jersey, and then the team went on to wear their 90s throwback uniforms that night, the ones that Blues fans probably most associate with Pronger. It's the only time they'll wear them this season, and that's how it should work, if you ask me. It was great to see this retro design come back for a night, and perfect for this particular occasion. But it's not necessarily something that needs to be used all the time. Uh, The Bruins also honored Willie O'Ree, retiring his number 22 on Tuesday. He became the first black player to skate in an NHL game back in 1958. And for that, he was also honored at the NHL level, in that players from every team wore a special decal on the back of their helmets that night. My last item is one I'll probably discuss more in the next episode. There's this Dallas Stars throwback design on an Adidas jersey that turned heads when it started floating around Twitter last week. The original photos came from HangerHockey.com, a Dallas Stars online retailer. They were selling them at one point before removing them from their website, so either they ran out or maybe they were posted too early by mistake. As I understand it, this is not a game jersey, but rather will be worn during pregame warm-ups on Friday when the Dallas Stars honor Sergei Zubov with his jersey retirement. On a related note, the Stars wore a very white version of this one as their reverse retro last year. 
I also wanted to talk about some really cool warm-up jerseys uh, from the past couple of weeks, but I don't want to spend too long on this segment, so I'm going to put together another video that's just about warm-up jerseys, probably at the end of the season. That way I can touch on all of the really good ones. All right, that's it for Loose Threads. Uh, up next, my first guest interview on the podcast, a chat with Andrew Greenstein, creator of the unofficial NHL uniform database. So stick around for that. Do me a favor, drop whatever you're doing right now. I mean, keep listening to this podcast, but open up a new tab and go to nhluniforms.com. If you're anything like me, it's already on your favorites list. The unofficial NHL uniform database is a complete visual history of every uniform worn in the history of the National Hockey League. For me, it's an absolute necessity. I reference it almost daily. So just keep it handy for this interview. You'll almost surely want to check it. But if you can't pull it up, uh, I will be showing screenshots throughout the interview. Uh, its mastermind is Andrew Greenstein. And about a month ago, he and I got together for a Zoom chat. It's a long interview about how he puts his passion on the internet for the world to enjoy. Uh, the thing is, I didn't really know what to do with that interview once we finished it. It didn't fit within any of the channel's existing series, and there's really no B-roll to speak of. You'd just be looking at us or a screenshot of his website the entire time. So I thought that would make for kind of a dull video on its own. But then a couple of weeks ago, I started this podcast, and the light bulb went off. I figured this was the perfect place to share our conversation. So you can, you can just listen along in the background, or if you want, you can pull up the video and see us as we chat and see some of the screenshots uh, of the site. But since it is a podcast, I don't feel too pressured to have really interesting visuals up throughout the conversation. All right, so here it is, my interview with Andrew Greenstein. Please enjoy. The person who keeps the best records of NHL uniforms, the entire history, is with me today. Uh, this is Andrew Greenstein from NHLuniforms.com. Hey, Andrew. Oh, good evening, Chris. It's great to uh, to speak with you uh, virtually like this. You know, I know that we've emailed a couple of times in the past, and it's finally nice to have a conversation with you like this. It sure is. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we've chatted here and there, but it, it but it's nice to finally talk with someone who has you know a similar uh, geekiness, nerdiness. Let's say passion <laughs> um, for hockey jersey design. Very good. I, I want to get everybody a little familiar with you, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from and, and what kind of drew you into the world of, of hockey jersey design? Well, I've, I've always liked, you know, the world of sports uniforms, not just hockey, but uh, all sports, you know, baseball, football, you know, what have you. Uh, I'm originally from uh, the Boston area. I'm now currently in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. And as you uh, can clearly see from my mic flag and uh, the sign in, uh, in the background, I am a reporter for KRLD Radio, which is Dallas, Fort Worth's all news radio station. All right. So, I, you know, your website uh, promotes 20 years. Congratulations on 20 years of doing the site. But how did you get started? Well, you know, it was back in the 1990s when I got my first computer. Um, I was just doodling in Microsoft Paint. Uh, just, I uh, uh, drew a little, um, uh, hockey Jersey template. I just focused on the back of the jerseys because, uh, back then, um, I didn't have the, um, uh, the really high powered, uh, editing tools and there were no such sites uh, like yours or, uh, Chris Creamer's site or any other site that I could easily download a, a, a logo from and, uh, go in and resize it. So I just focused on the backs, uh, for, uh, for a while. And then in the early 2000s, I uh, started focusing on the fronts and one thing led to another. I taught myself some basic basic HTML and I put together a website. Uh, what kind of tools do you use now as you're updating uh, jerseys? Believe it or not, I, uh, 20 years later, I still use Microsoft Paint um, primarily. Yeah, because I use it to really go in and, um, if, uh, and really fine tune you know, the lettering and the numbers, you know, on the backs. Uh, but obviously that's not the only thing that I use. I also use um, uh, Adobe Paint Shop Pro or Co Corel Paint Shop Pro, I should say. Uh, so I use that to, um, you know, do things like the gradients that you see uh, on the images uh, to resize the, the logos, to put them in proportion with the jersey template. Uh, resize the letter or the lettering and the numbering, you know, if necessary. Uh, and uh, that, then those are the two uh, tools that I use. I mean, it's that, it's that attention to detail 
that for me makes your site an invaluable resource. It's just necessary that it exists on the web. Well, I, I, try, I try to get it as perfect as possible uh, with, with varying degrees of success. <laughs> <laughs> so now do you collect jerseys? I really don't actually. Um, you know, I have a couple of them in my closet, but uh, you know, none, none that none that fit me. You know, I've I've got a couple of jerseys. Uh, I have one jersey that hangs on the wall of my house. But other than that, I'm really not much of a jersey collector. What's the one jersey that hangs on the wall in your house? Uh, I got a Bruins jersey as a Christmas gift uh, several years back with uh, uh, four autographs in the Bruins crest. As you build your graphics, uh, are there any particular challenges that you face, especially lately? Um, in terms of some of the new materials that are being used. You see a lot more uh, kind of shiny materials and gradients happening in jerseys, uh, perforated numbers, anything like that? Uh, sometimes I do. Um, you know, as far as, um, you know, with, with the shininess and the, the metallic nature, I try to indicate that as much as possible. Sometimes, you know, like especially this year when you have a lot of crests, that have a lot of um, detail to them, like that, like the Calgary Flames, um, that have you know details of like the same color. Uh, sometimes, as far as that goes, it's just hopeless for me. So I just uh, I sometimes disregard those. If you really can't see them on television, and you can't see them unless you're looking at them really closely up close, then uh, I may disregard some of those minute details. Yeah, those new 3D crests are, are a bit of a pain. I know, I mean, the, the Buffalo Sabres one is a good example. It looks great when you when you see a close-up shot of that crest, but I know it's hard to reproduce in, in kind of a digital format. And then and, and, and the, the further out that you, uh, that you are, you know, uh, all those details kind of get lost from a distance. So how do you keep up with all the changes each year? Do you have a relationship with the NHL or are you kind of doing this as a fan? I do it strictly as a common fan. I have no relationship with the National Hockey League. They are aware that my site exists. I went to them several years ago. I asked them, would you have a problem if I named my site the NHL Uniform Database? They came back to me and they said, we would prefer that you call it the unofficial NHL Uniform Database. I don't want to give anyone the impression that I have a relationship with the league or my site is affiliated with the league. You know, I try to separate that as much as possible. I want to convey that it's about the league, but it's not by the league. But you're asking, you know, well, what uh, resources I use? One of the resources I use is your website, uh, Aesthetics, uh, to keep up with, you know, the changes, you know, um, you know who's coming out with an alternate jersey, uh, who's, who's not, who's retiring theirs. Yeah, so it's your site, yeah, Chris Creamer's site I use all the time. Uh, he knows that uh, I lift his logos and, of course, you know, adjust the colors so that, you know, they match up with the colors on my jersey, uh, adjust the size and things like that, because there's no way that I can reproduce those logos myself. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, how do you how do you go about researching some of the older jerseys? And I'm talking about like really early history of the NHL. How do you go about getting those details? Sometimes I use things like, you know, Google images or Getty images. Um, you know, the best thing that I do, you know, to date the jerseys, I do two things. I look for a player that um, may have been with the team only for a short period of time. And especially to get the colors right, I try to look for a uniform, uh, a photo of a uniform being worn against an opponent. So that's how I could tell, for example, that um, uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs, that their blue is the exact same color as the Tampa Bay Lightning's blue. And sometimes, you know, I would see a highlight and I, I can't tell uh, at first glance, at a quick glance, whether the team that's playing are the Tampa Bay Lightning or the Toronto Maple Leafs, because those two uniforms, you know, are very, very familiar, very similar to one another, which means one of them has to change. I would agree. I think I, I think black and silver need to be returned to the Lightning's look, right? It just, it just oh, absolutely. To- or it's something so that they don't look like somebody else. Um, because that, that's really one of the hallmarks of a good uniform design is you should be able to look at it in an instant and just like that, identify the, the team that it is. You know, when you look at the Tampa Bay Lightning at first glance, uh, you know, if they're playing the Florida Panthers, then you might be able to deduct that 
to deduce that that's the Tampa Bay Lightning. If they're playing the Montreal Canadiens, you might be fooled. But even then, all of those four teams even are in then, the same yeah. division now. That's the crazy yeah, thing. Yeah, they actually faced one another in the Stanley Cup final last season. Yeah, exactly. You know, going back to a little bit of the early history um, of the mm-hmm. NHL, you know, a lot of those jerseys, sweaters, were handmade and, and the, the, even the crests were hand-stitched. And so, you know, it wasn't like a, a factory where they're all exactly the same. How do you go about um, sort of dealing with variations in, in a crest design that you see from one jersey to the next? Uh, then in those cases, I just pick one that, uh, you know, that's the most representative of what they wore back in the era. And I leave it at that. Obviously, they were the, the attention to detail back then is not as it is today. Uh, and sometimes like, um, you know, with some photos, um, you know, being scarce in number, uh, sometimes on the back, I just have to take an educated guess as to what they wore. So at least in those earlier, earlier days, I can't really vouch 100% for the accuracy of what you see on the site. Um, but I, I try to get as close as possible. One of the uh, jerseys or the uniforms that uh, really gave me fits was the second one of the old Pittsburgh Pirates from, I think it was like um, 1919. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Like 1929 or something. And for the longest time, I couldn't tell what colors they were, but only in doing some additional research. And I believe someone may have emailed this to me as well. um, I found out that their colors were Harding Blue, uh, the shade named after uh, former President Warren G. Harding, uh, and gold. Whereas I thought originally it was going to be black and gold because that's the colors of pretty much all Pittsburgh teams. But... uh, no, but I, I was able to find it out that way, and I was able to uh, to make the change. That's fascinating. I didn't even know that. That's really cool. So I want to switch gears a little bit and get into your some of your personal preferences as far as jersey design goes. Um, you know, what kind of jerseys are you most drawn to, and what kind of designs do you find more off putting? You know, nowadays, you know, I think simple as in. You know, contrast that with the 1990s where you saw. Um, gradients, you saw sublimation, you saw all these really crazy designs like the New York Islanders, uh, maybe to a lesser extent the Washington Capitals, which is a little bit more tame compared to what the Islanders brought out in the mid-1990s. Today, and you're not seeing it in just the NHL, but you're seeing it across all sports, uh, you're really seeing a trend towards simplification. And um, But really, as I said before, the best designs are the ones that you could see it in an instant, identify the team that it is. And most importantly, when you and I are um, watching our respective games from the cheap seats, um, that you should be able to make out the numbers you know, from the upper row and the upper deck. Yeah, totally true. And I think, you know, that's it's funny that that's one of the things they focused on with the stadium series jerseys in recent years is that uh, not just on the back, but also the sleeves, the numbers are huge. Uh, what do that's you think of right, those? Because- yeah, because in the stadium series, you know, as you know, um, the fans are quite a distance away from the ice. Yeah, I went to the Heritage Classic in 2014 in, uh, in Vancouver, and it was it was tough. Like, we kind of had uh, lower seats, uh, but, you know, you're just so far back from the ice, you can't hardly see anything. Yeah, the 2014 Heritage Classic, the, the only outdoor game that was played indoors. Indoors, yeah, exactly right. <laughs> we, were, we were saved from the rain. Yes. <laughs> You know, one thing that I see a lot of people pushing for is the return of white jerseys at home. And I know that's something, you know, obviously with your site that you've tracked over the years and the most recent changes, you know, in 1970, they switched from dark at home to white at home. And then 2003 is when it switched again. Right. And we still have, you know, the dark jerseys at home. Where do you stand on white at home? You know, I don't have a problem with uh, with the dark jerseys at home. Uh, I know why they did that is because... Um, This way that um, a team can uh, wear their alternate jerseys at home and uh, the opponent would not have to bring two sets of uniforms with them when they're on a road trip. Yeah. And then the LA Kings blew that up by having a white third jersey this year. (laughs) Oh, they they did. Yes. (laughs) No, but, um, you know, I think there are arguments for both. And, you know, I, you know, in going off on a tangent here, you notice like in the NBA, they did away with home jerseys and road jerseys altogether. Um, now you, the, the rule is you can wear 
any color jersey in any building. And if one team is wearing their color jersey, the other team is under no obligation to wear their white jersey. The only uh, stipulation is they have to wear a jersey that is of a clearly contrasting color. That is the kind of rule I'd like to see the NHL adopt. Of course, you know, like in the NBA, the, the uniform consists of a, a tank top and a pair of shorts. In the NHL, you have a little bit more equipment. You've got, you know, jerseys that are much larger in size. You got the socks. Uh, you got the different helmets. Uh, and in some cases, different gloves. Uh, so you have a lot more equipment to bring with you if, you're, if your road trip calls for wearing multiple jersey sets. Yeah, it's a lot more to pack. Personally, I've always been a fan of the dark jerseys at home because, you know, if I'm in the home crowd, I don't want to see the rink filled with the opposing team's colors. You know, if I'm at a lightning game, for example, in Tampa, I don't want to see Red Wings red all over the ice. There's enough of it in the stands. But, you know, I'd I'd rather see lightning blue fill the ice. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a very good point. And of course, the other uh, side of that coin is, you know, if uh, one team wears their color jerseys at home, then they're always like, for example, the Dallas Stars. Um, uh, when you go to a Dallas Stars game before they brought out their alternate jerseys, you knew that the matchup was going to be green versus white. Um, but, you know, you still have the color, you know, in the opposing team shorts and, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers, that the, the color of the numbers, the color of the trim and all that. So, you know, it really doesn't bother me when you have uh, the home team wearing their dark jerseys and the road team wearing their white jerseys. Another trend we're seeing a lot lately, I think, is third jerseys um, with throwback designs. How do you feel mm-hmm. about throwbacks as third jerseys? Uh, I, you know, again, you know, it's not, there's nothing that I have a problem with. Um, and as, as you're seeing that a lot of these throwback uh, uh, third jerseys, they're becoming their primary jerseys. Um, you know, the, the Winnipeg Jets, for example, they have uh, both their white and blue versions of their throwback jerseys do exist. Um, you know, the interesting thing there, if I, I may be mistaken here, but even though the Arizona Coyotes um, have the possession of the Winnipeg Jets 1.0 records and, and history, I believe all of their logos and uniforms belong with the Winnipeg Jets 2.0, I believe. That sounds right to me. It, it's a it's a really weird setup, but yeah, I mean, obviously they're they're making full use of those uh, of those old uniforms and old logos. Well, keep in mind that when uh, the when the Thrashers moved to Winnipeg at that time, the Coyotes were owned by the NHL, and the NHL told that franchise, "Hey, if you want to name yourself the Jets, go right ahead." So that's how they became also the Winnipeg Jets. Here's the other thing I'm curious about because I'm kind of a proponent for. I don't love the idea of. Uh, throwback third jerseys. I'd rather see teams do something new with their third jersey, something kind of out there the way Dallas did actually is a good example. Um, What do you think of the idea of maybe the NHL introducing a fourth jersey program where the fourth is a throwback? We've already seen it for some teams in recent years, but it's not been really made official in any way. Well, you had that, uh, you had that last season with the reverse retro program, which I thought was a very, very good idea. Uh, whereas the NBA this season, they have the, the mixtape uh, series uh, with their 75th anniversary. Last year, you had uh, the reverse retro program. And I understand that they could be coming back from, from your side, as a matter of fact, that it could be coming back next season. Uh, maybe with, uh, with different reverse retro designs. Hopefully this time, the Red Wings and the Islanders will be a little bit more imaginative with their, with their reverse retro designs. That would help a lot. So the other thing I wanted to get your take on are the uh, the outdoor jerseys. You have the Winter Classic and the Heritage Classic, which, you know, we kind of understand their sense of style is very throwback, very retro. Uh, and then you have on the other side, the Stadium Series, which is the complete opposite. Um, how yeah. do you feel about those uh, those programs? Hey, I, I, I think they're, they're all great. You know, the, the, the Winter Classic and the Heritage Classic, you know, they're really more the, the, the throwback, the, um, the one when... You know, in the old days of hockey, when they were played on frozen ponds outdoors. So that's when you really go back to the heritage of the sport, whereas the stadium series that are played in more non-traditional um, markets, you know, not always, sometimes in traditional markets, but, you know, uh, games that are played in California, like Los Angeles or San Francisco, that uh, those are your stadium series uh, opportunities. And, you know, why not? You know, if it's just for one game, you know, be wild with it. You know, it's a... Uh, you know, it's a conversation piece. You know, if uh, I don't know if like uh, the Avalanche jersey that they wore 
a couple of years ago during the stadium series. I don't think I'd want to see that <laughs> at at Ball Arena, but uh, you know, for for one game, you know, I don't have a problem with that. That's what I say. One off, just do something crazy. Uh, you know, and the other one. Speaking of kind of crazy jerseys, uh, I think the NHL All Star Game is really known for that. Do you have a favorite set from over the years? I think the ones that I'm most partial to are the ones from the late '80s and early '90s. Um, the um, the black and orange ones. Yeah, there's a sort of a classic NHL All Star look, right? All right, so I wanted to uh, kind of wrap things up by talking about maybe the the future of uh, the unofficial. NHL uniform database. Do you have any big plans for the site or do you just kind of plan on staying the course? For now, I'm planning on staying the course. I might um, fill in a couple of um, like on the mobile site um, when you're looking at it on your on your iPhones or your Android phones. Uh, I have a de- I have a separate uh, mobile version of it, uh, which is a little bit more pared down just to focus more on the uniforms and not from the filler material that I put on the desktop site. But I may include like some of the information like the patches and some special uniforms on the mobile site that I currently don't have on uh, the desktop site, but you know, that, that would be a uh, uh, possible, you know, in, uh, in some time in the future. Now, some years back, you built a, a WHA world hockey association offshoot um, that you, you've got all of the jerseys that were worn uh, during that relatively short uh, period of time that the WHA existed. Uh, that's really cool. And if anybody hasn't seen it, whauniforms.com, give a little plug for it. Um, do you have any interest or, or time, I guess, in doing any other offshoots with other maybe minor leagues? Um, not really, only because, you know, I have a much more than full-time job and uh, the NHL site, you know, takes up a lot of my time as it is. Uh, so I just keep, keep it at the NHL. Of course, you know, there's nothing to update with the WHA. That league hasn't been around since 1979. Um, so that, that's kind of, uh, you know, put to bed there. So, you know, the, the, maintaining the NHL site, that, that, that's plenty for me. Uh, if anyone else wants to do, uh, an AHL site or anything like that, I would say, you know, go, go right ahead. You have, you have my blessing. <laughs> that, may, that may be in my near future if I can find the time for it too. And, you know, I got to tell you the the thing that I look forward to most, it's the launch of the next season, the newest page of NHLuniforms.com. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Well, it's been great talking with you, Andrew. Uh, I hope we get a chance to do it again at some point in the future. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Absolutely. You have a great rest of the night now. All right, we'll end the show on a bit of concept commentary. And there are two that I really want to dive into today. First, of course, is Heritage Hopes by Nick Stella. This was posted January 10th. Nick was in our top 10 concept video for 2020, and he was an honorable mention in 2021. I think he's got to be back on the list in 2022. This is just all kinds of gorgeous. And as I commented in the post, we should be so lucky to see an outdoor game look this good. It's just amazing what Nick did here. And using all existing logo artwork too. For the Sabres, he's using their existing secondary logo, but with the colors reversed. The striping is great. I love the big blue cuffs on the sleeves. And the shoulders, come on. This is exactly the aesthetic of the Heritage Classic. And even the Maple Leafs design. I'm not normally a fan of using that vintage white beige color, but in small doses, I can get on board. And Nick uses it well here. And then he balances it out with a bit of green in that Leafs Irish-themed specialty branding. Uh, Keep in mind, this game is taking place just four days before St. Patrick's Day. So we're likely to see their St. Pat's jersey very soon after the Heritage Classic. Anyway, I just love this concept, and I won't be surprised at all to see it in next year's top 10. The other one came the next day, January 11th. Green Infused Orca by Kevin Dion. I was just talking in last week's podcast about how the Canucks primary logo and jerseys have totally separate color palettes. Looks like that's what Kevin was trying to address here and he really nailed it. Turns out all you had to do was swap the silver outline with green and simplify the design a little, but it's really well done. And then the V stripes on the sleeve, a nice callback to Vancouver's inaugural uniforms, just icing on the cake. So I wanted to call special attention to these designs because they just really stand out. They're great. Uh, To wrap up, I wanted to share another unpublished concept, going back to Nick Stella, actually. This one will be posted next month, uh, but to thank you for watching this podcast, I'm giving you a sneak peek right now. It's definitely going out on a freakout Friday, but it's just too good uh, not to talk about. It's a home and road design for the Atlanta Thrashers assuming they still existed, but it doesn't use any of the branding the team actually had. Here, Kevin employed one of the unused logos that was in my most recent NHL prototypes video, 
the Angry Bird in maroon, gold, and black. He used the feathers as inspiration for the sleeve striping, which is really cool. And I don't know if it would have ever played in the NHL, maybe we're better off without it, but it just hit me as being really unique, not like any other team I could picture. So there's a sneak peek at an unpublished concept. Uh, again, look for it to pop up on the showcase sometime in February. And that does it for episode three of the podcast. Thank you again for listening and or watching. If you have any suggestions for future topics, uh, let me know in the comments below, or you can find me on Twitter at Aesthetics. Before you go, just remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet and tap the like button too on this video. That's all for now. See you next time.